So I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous this morning because with this whole stage thing, we've got a ledge right here, and it's right in my sweet spot. So if you see me going back or something, wave, let me know that um, I'm about to wipe out. It's a great week for me to preach on family because I was away from mine all week. So if I was to come this morning to give a sermon on parenting and family and all that, and I was with mine and I was all tied in knots and frustrated, the sermon would probably go a lot different. But I've really got a great, I'm in a great place because I had a break all week and I was able to think and pray and, and I missed them all week. And so now I'm able to open God's word and, and really give a good, unjaded sermon um, on God's design for family. If you, if you come to a place ever, and uh, I know there's some of you who have done this before, and some of you who are, where you get serious about biking or cycling, any kind, it doesn't matter, road biking or mountain biking, it doesn't matter what type, as long as it's not motor biking, but as long as you're cycling in some way, you, you reach a place where clip-in pedals become relevant and needed. Uh, what those are, if you don't know and you've never become serious about it, is, is there these, it's a really cool mechanism where your pedals, uh, you change them out and you have special shoes and you're able to clip those shoes, secure them into the pedals. Uh, you may be wondering, why in the world would anybody ever want to do that? Well, it's really cool because here's what happens. When you're pedaling on a bike, you're pushing, right, your force push the pedal. Well, when the pedal comes back this way, you've got no force. You're just pushing with this one. So it's push, push, push. When somebody explained to me for the first time that what clipping pedals do is it allows you not only with a push force, but with a pull force too. So it essentially doubles your force and, and, and your efficiency skyrockets, right? Because you're pushing and you're pulling. I got really excited when I found that out the first time. And so I remember getting them, putting them on, uh, getting so excited about it. You get in there, you, you put your foot down, and you kind of push a little bit, and you hear a click, and uh, your, your feet click into those pedals. You get on, and sure enough, it was all I thought it was going to be. It felt really good. You can tell a difference, a big difference, such a big difference that you don't want to go back and ever ride a bike again that just has normal pedals because you feel the power and the efficiency of it. And all the excitement, you guys probably know where I'm going with this, and all of the excitement of getting on and feeling it and enjoying it once you're in, you never think about practicing how to get out of them. Your feet are attached to those pedals, and so you're in it and you're riding, it doesn't matter how far you rode, whether you're on a mountain bike and you enjoyed a great ride, or, or you're on a road bike, 20, 30, 40, 60 mile ride, awesome, but you reach a point where you need to stop, right, at a red light or whatever it is, wherever you are, and if it's the first time and you're really lucky or blessed, then it's a place you're by yourself, you're isolated, nobody's watching, and you're surrounded by soft grass. Because what happens is you come to that place where you need to stop and you realize you don't know how to get your feet out. And slowly but surely, hopefully slowly, you reach that stop and then you just go right over. Some of you may have seen this happen on the side of the road before because it's not uncommon to see, like in an intersection, somebody come, and this is probably the more common experience by many cyclists, you get there and you're not isolated and you're not by yourself and maybe you're with 20 or 30 other cyclists around you as well as a street light with cars everywhere and you're the one who comes to a stop and then fades slowly onto the concrete. It's, uh, this, it happened to me more than once because I, uh, I never had the funds to get a really nice bike when I was doing a lot of cycling, so I always borrowed, and every set of pedals and shoes are different. All of the pedals, you can tighten or loosen them, so I, 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 I walked through that humiliating experience multiple times, but the good thing is, is once you've done it once, you know what's coming, and when you feel it, you can announce it to everybody. I'm going down, and it's not quite as big of a deal, or they can move, right? You're not going to take out multiple people, but it's this idea of eventually, as you're moving, when you come to a stop, all of the forces that surround you, right, the greatest of which is probably gravity, begin to be greater than the force of you moving forward. 
And so there's only one place to go, down. You're going to crash. I think this week, I think this whole series, but parenting, marriage too, as we're moving along and moving forward, what happens is we're surrounded by forces, right? We talked about this last week with marriage, all of the cultural voices, the media, everything that's trying to define marriage for us outside of God's word and his design. Parenting is the exact same way. How many books out there can you go and you find that's the latest and greatest silver bullet strategy to parenting? And they're everywhere. We have all kinds of voices and forces surrounding us. And the moment that are pushing with God's word forward, the moment that quiets in our spirit, all of the other forces, all of the other voices overwhelm us and we're going to crash and burn. My hope today and next week, specifically in regards to parenting, is that we would see, understand the need to constantly be coming back to God's word and amidst all of the other voices that surround us, whether that's media or great books or talk shows, whatever they are, that it's God's word that drives us forward and that we're not overwhelmed, we're not persuaded by all of the other psycho babble that we hear every day. God has given us an amazing gift in his word. We're not left to wonder. We're given instruction. We're given his intention for what our homes, whether it's marriage as we talked about for two weeks, or our parenting journey, what those are supposed to look like. The only way that we are going to find ourselves not in that place of crashing and burning is if the voice of God in our lives is greater than all of the other voices. Greater than than all we hear, media, and all the other books. If it's God's voice that is louder and suppressing those, that's the only way that we're going to continue driving forward towards this goal of God's design for marriage and family. So we desperately need this regular dose. What does God's word say? What does God's intention for my home and my parenting journey. And so this week, I hope that we clarify that win for us. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is amidst all of the places, and we could go to New Testament spots and a lot of Old Testament places, but this really feels like the foundation. And as we're doing this family architecture series, it just felt right to go back to this original design. I'm going to read, beginning in verse 1, all the way through verse 9, and then we'll go back and look at some specific words here. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, me being Moses, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear The Lord, Yahweh, your God, and you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, and a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You can flip back to the previous chapter 
and see in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that it's the Ten Commandments that were just given. And I think that's important for us to see for a lot of different reasons. But as we began reading there, and I read the, the greatest commandment, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules. I'm back in verse 1. That the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land. All of these thems pointing back to those commandments. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you. This is a beautiful moment in history and in God's relationship with his people because this is the moment as we look back where he's, he's delivering his word uh, in a similar way, not the same, but in a similar way to we have his word today. It's a, it's a revelation of God's desire and how God's people can commune with him and how they can be obedient to his heart. It's such a great moment in history. He's given them such a foundational idea of here's how you are to live. These, these words are, are if you want to live a life that honors me, God, Yahweh, the God of your forefathers, then here's how you live. Here's what you do. We have all of those commandments, and the truth is our modern ears typically stop right there with Obey his word. Do what he says. We get that and we hear that, but, but we don't have those same ears that are so tuned to the multi-generational voice of God here that doesn't just say, hey guys, you obey me. You come in and you find my word and you commune with me through living a life that's obedient with these statutes. But what he goes on to say, you and your son, and your son's son. It keeps going. It wasn't just about you, but it was also a a gift. It was also instruction that was meant to be multi-generational through the home, through the families. It wasn't just you live life and don't worry about anything else, but it was you live life glorifying the Father and you live that life and teach your son and your son's son and the generations how to do it as well. So the word of God miraculously revealed to them, miraculously revealed to us too. We have it here in the same way they had, something a little different. We have much more. And yet so many times we're caught in thinking that this is just about me. It's a me, myself, and I spirituality. God gave me his word, and so I need to be somebody who obeys his word, and that's the end of the thought process and the end of the journey for us. He didn't give us his word just so that you might be able to wrestle with it and study it and and, and live a life of obedience to it but he also gave it miraculously to us so that you, as you live that life, might also pass it on generation after generation. And we see a different, a new purpose and even the miraculous provision of the word of God. Such a gift. So right there from the beginning, we see this multi-generational theme begin to form. We get down into verse 4. I'll read again. Here, O Israel, we hear this is often called the Shema because of that word here. It's the Hebrew word for here. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them as you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. When we come to verse 4, we, we see this, uh, Jesus speaks of this and kind of quotes it in the New Testament, but this is like this summary statement here from God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It's a, the summary idea that is as if to say, if you do this, all of those other things will happen. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, then out of that will flow the obedience to all of these other things that have just been given to you. It's a, it's a summary idea. Jesus uses it in the same way in the New Testament. But it begins with this affirmation. The Lord our God, 
the Lord is one. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You see, their culture was very polytheistic, right? All of these other gods. And so for them, maybe the immediate significance was, hey, guys, our God is the one true God. We don't worship the God of the sun God and the love God and all that, but Yahweh, the one true God. And so that was a big affirmation for them, but we might think today that, well, we don't need that anymore. It's not relevant to us, but that's not the case. Our culture worships the career God, the sex God, all of those things. So we are still today in a very polytheistic culture just as much as they were. And so this affirmation that begins these words is so important for us to understand before we move on to the application ideas that are in verses 5, 6, and 7. We must begin with seeing that the object of our worship is enormously important. The object of our worship. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Our children are so incredibly intelligent. I know some of you are going to want to argue with me. Mine's not. They are. Trust me. All of them are. They see, and they learn, and they understand. No matter what kind of words come out of our mouth, no matter how good we know how to say the right things or even where our bodies take us on Sundays or other days of the week. Our children watch us. And if we're living a life that worships not the one true God, but but, but a God who does this here and that we go to on Sunday, but also the God of career on these days and the God of money on these days, they see it and they know it. It's clear, crystal clear to them. The first statement that you have on your worship guide this morning is the foundation of our parenting is built upon the exclusivity of our worship. The foundation of our parenting is built upon the exclusivity of our worship. You see, if we live out a life that knows how to talk about Jesus at the right times and knows how to be at church on Sundays, but yet look something completely different at other times, Well, then our children look at that, and that is their definition for what it looks like to follow Jesus. How we worship is how they understand how to worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So the exclusivity of our worship but then also the ongoing work of gospel transformation in us. You may be confused. Matt, wait a minute. I thought we were going with this whole parenting thing this morning. When you're talking about me now, I didn't come for that. You cannot disciple that which you are not. Does that make sense? You can't reproduce something if you yourselves aren't that And so what we're doing here, and what you'll hear me say so many times this morning, is we are all discipling our children. Every one of us in this room, every home that exists in the Katy community, they're all discipling their children. Discipling them in what? To be what? And if our worship isn't exclusive, if we're not living a life that says, the Lord, he's one, he is the object of my worship, and I'm loving him with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my might, if I'm not journeying in that way, being transformed to give him every single aspect of who I am, then I'm not discipling my children to do that either. We could spend a lot of time talking about what this looks like this morning, but in this context and for, for this morning, I just want you to see that, that, that foundationally, as we move beyond the object of our worship, the exclusivity of, of not all these other gods, but of Christ, that we also see that our own transformation journey is, is a foundational, it's a, it's a crucial aspect of our discipleship journey within our homes. It's the second statement that you have 
on your worship guide, the sustaining force in our parenting is our ongoing gospel transformation. The sustaining force in our parenting is our ongoing gospel transformation. This morning, as we get further here and we begin to talk about some of the hows, if you jump to the hows before you get to the place to really wrestle with and reflect upon your own spiritual journey, you've missed the boat here. Stop, write down, come back to this idea that the first and greatest thing that you can do in your parenting journey to be to follow God's design, God's picture, his foundation of parenting given by his word is that you yourself are being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you yourself are worshiping the one true God and him alone. So as we continue reading, we see, here's in verse 6, these words that I command you today, they shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. I love watching baseball. I like my son to enjoy watching baseball too. That's all. I don't watch football. That seems so un-Texan maybe, but I can't. Maybe it's the day of the week that it happens. Like Sundays, I can't just go and, and watch football, but I don't. I love baseball. And so because I love baseball, I bring my son along and I want him to love baseball too with me. I also really enjoy volleyball, and I always have. Even when I was in high school, I enjoyed playing volleyball. So I love encouraging that in my daughters, both of them. They both enjoy playing. So I like going out in the driveway and playing with them. I enjoy going and watching them. I enjoy encouraging them because it's something that I love. I love all kinds of outdoor physical activity, whether that's running or doing anything like that. I enjoy doing it with them, and I enjoy kind of fanning the flame of their joy in those things. I love learning. I love reading. I'm an addictive learner. If I can grab a hold of something new, I love just digging and losing myself in it. So I love the idea of passing on that desire to love to read and love to learn to my children. But I love Jesus more than all of those things. And the question that I have to wrestle with in me and in my home and in my responsibility is amidst all of those things, am I teaching, am I training them to love Jesus more than I'm teaching my son to love baseball or my daughters to love volleyball for all of them to to love reading books as great as that is? Am I teaching them to love Jesus more than all of those things? You see, we're all training our children. Every one of us, there are some I would be willing to bet, I don't bet, but I would be willing to bet that there are probably some little kids back there that already know where they're going to college. I bet you we have some Aggies back there in that children's ministry already. Why? Because you love your school. You talk about it. They watch the Aggie football games with you. You're discipling them and you're training them to love that. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. Maybe a little bit. But it is incredibly wrong when they know more and desire more to be at A&M University than they do a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we have to embrace the fact that we're all training our children to do something, to love something. The question is, what? What is it? And here's how. Here's an answer. Here's an answer to that. We're discipling them to become what we are. That's what you're training your children to be. You're discipling them to become what you are, and second, you're discipling them to become what you constantly communicate to them. So if you're here and you're listening and you're wondering, I don't know how I fit into this, what am I training my children to be? You you step back for a minute and you ask yourself the question, who am I? That's who you're discipling your children to become. What do I constantly communicate to them? That's who you're discipling your children to be to become. Our children 
all of our children are depraved sinners. According to Romans 5.12, all of us, every single one of us in this room and every single child that's down that wing, they were born sinners. They weren't born good. They weren't born pure. They were born with a sin nature just like every one of us in here. What they need from us is the gospel. What they need is to be discipled and trained. They need to see parents that love Jesus and are a model to follow. They need to see parents, a father, a mother, who speaks not only who they are, living by example, but speaks continuously the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they are sinners and their only hope for salvation is the gospel. And we're the ones who are with them every single day. It's an amazing gift and yet an amazing challenge. The last statement on your worship guide. The strategy of biblical parenting is the immersive gospeling of our children. I think I made that word up, but I like it. The strategy of biblical parenting is the immersive gospeling of our children. This is the scripture showing us what that looks like. How do we effectively gospel our children? It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Teach them diligently literally means repeat over and over again. That's why I say what you say constantly, the words that come out of your mouth are what you're discipling your children to become. That's what it means when we see that teach them diligently to your your children, to inculcate. If we are to disciple our children in the way that God has called us, then we're to constantly repeat gospel truths to them. Constantly repeat gospel truths constantly, repetitively. We know this is true, and we, we, we know the relevancy of this because how many of us in this room can tell our children on Monday, I need you to bathe this week, and they're gonna do it every night? How many of us can say, I need you to clean your room, and it's gonna stay clean? I need you to pick up your shoes, and they're just gonna do it? That's not the case. This should be encouraging to us, right? Because we need to tell them repetitively gospel truths in the same way. That's how they learn. That's the same reason that we can't tell them on Monday to bathe and think they're going to bathe all week. We've got to say it over and over again. That's how Jesus is going to reveal himself to them is as we live our own lives being transformed by the gospel and as we communicate to them constantly this steady stream, this steady flow of gospel truths to them. It changes who they are. So as if these words were not clear enough, he he goes on to show us, right, the conversations, the conversations of of gospel truth. They're when you sit in your house. They're when you walk to all of your destinations. They're when you finish your day and you lie down to go to sleep. And they're the first things that you think about and say when you open your eyes during the first moments of your day. This could be incredibly overwhelming if you're thinking about this and you hear this for the first time and if the first thing that you begin to think is I need a I need to I I need the tools on how to do this I don't know I don't have the words to say to be able to accomplish this what I want to I want to give you some freedom here what this text is saying is you love Jesus you bring them along on that journey with you you love Jesus You, with your heart, with your soul, with your might, every bit of you exclusively worshiping him. And then you grab your children and as you are being changed and as you're communicating what you value and how God's changing you, you bring them along and you begin talking to them about gospel truths. They see that change happening in you. As you apologize to them for reacting in anger to them, they see grace and they see gospel truths. You explain and you teach who you are and who you're becoming to them as you sit as you go as you finish the day as you begin the day if this is still feeling really cloudy to you i'm going to give you two two ideas here two things if you're if you're in a place today and you're like in my family i i'm not doing this and i want to and i don't know where to begin 
Here it is. First, prioritize your personal relationship with Jesus Christ through the daily interaction with him through his word. Most important, you're duplicating who you are. Be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, we have a great resource here that we use. Long story short, it's a book that allows you, gives you some material if you feel like I just don't know what to say. That's what this is for. It it gives you the things to say, conversations to have at home that coincides with what your children are doing on Sunday morning here. And so you get to continue a discussion that was already being had on Sunday morning with their awesome volunteers and teachers, and you have this resource to have that conversation with them. Here it is. You don't know where to start, that's where you start. But everything in our culture drives us to be a performance, check off the box, destination oriented people. That is not the destination. If you hear me this morning and you hear, okay, I need to have a quiet time and I need to read a chapter in this book every night with my kids and then I'm doing it, you're misunderstanding. I'm giving you the starting block to the race here. The starting block, the part, the piece, the little, the object that you push off of to go forward is here. Devote yourself to your relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's a resource to help you begin a discussion. But what we just read here, as you go along, when you wake up, when you sit at home, when you go to bed, it's a constant flood of communication. It's not about one meeting a week. It's not about 15 minutes every night. It's about you loving Jesus and you allowing your children to hear from you gospel truths constantly. When you begin to embrace this, when you begin to navigate this path, you will find your days are full of teachable moments. They're full of open doors for gospel communication. I can tell you with every one of our children, it looks different. For our youngest, they're so frequent all throughout the day and everything that he does and all the choices that he makes, they're all over the place. We can constantly talk about Jesus. With our oldest in high school, she gets home at the end of the day and we begin to dialogue about what happened in her day, their gospel conversations. When at night we go through and we look at her phone every night, we go over it and we see social media interaction and communication and we have conversations with her about that. They're gospel conversations. They're all part of the discipleship journey. Our lives are full of these teachable moments. And my question to you, my challenge to you as we close here this morning is that in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now, your children are going to be gathered around much like you would be today or this evening. Maybe they're talking with friends. Maybe they're engaged in a small group atmosphere somewhere. What are they going to say when they reflect on what did mom and dad pass along to me? Would it be a love for football? Would it be to be a good Aggie? Or would it be to know and love and follow Jesus with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind? May we be a church that does everything that we possibly can to facilitate that environment. May we be a church that encourages one another, homes to homes in here, that that is our pursuit, to be people that love Jesus, all of our heart, soul, and our mind, and that bring our children along on that journey and communicate a constant flood of gospel reality to them. 